Oh, sure. I made my way to the Bayshore area just simply because it's the best place in New Jersey, no doubt about that. I was brought up in Union, in Union County, in the town of Union. Um, went to Mount St. Mary's Academy in North Plainfield and um, went to nursing school for a year, but I met Jimmy Smith and so I fell in love and left nursing school and got married in 1955. And Jimmy lived in Highlands, his family lived in Highlands, and he told me it was the best place to live. So that's where we moved to, we moved to, to Highlands. And I lived in Highlands for 40 years. Then we spent 10 years traveling in an RV on the road, saw all 50 states. And then when I came back, I, I was working at Naval Weapon Station Earl. So I lived in Freehold for a while after Jimmy died. And then was able to come back to the Bay Shore. So now I'm in Atlantic Highlands, which is almost as nice as Highlands, but it's still all part of Middletown, all part of the Bay Shore. So it's very special places here. Um, he was the chairman of the draft board in Union during World War I. And, uh, I'm sorry, he was draft board, uh, uh, he was chairman of the draft board during World War II. And uh, when the president named him chairman of the draft board, the first thing he did was write to the president and tell the president that he was not going to draft any fathers until every single man had been drafted or had been deferred for specific good reasons. Um, he was a reporter for the Newark News and had done a considerable number of stories about the men who were being deferred because they had important jobs, but they were jobs that most anybody could do. And he didn't like the fact that there were single men who were being deferred while men who had young children had to serve. Um, so that's why he wrote the letter to the president. Eventually the law was changed and he never did um, draft any fathers until I guess it was around 1943 when they had to. I mean, we just needed too many soldiers and he understood it at that time. But in the beginning, he wasn't going to draft any fathers until all the single men were, were, de were either deferred legally, properly, or were out there serving. And this is when my brothers were teenagers. They were 14 and 16. So he well knew that if the war was continuing, his own sons would go. And he was ready to send my brothers rather than send a father. I kind of think I inherited it. My father was a newspaper reporter for the Newark Evening News, rather controversial newspaper reporter for the Newark Evening News. Um, my first job when I was 13 years old was working in the classified ad section, I was a proofreader for their ads at the Newark News during summers and weekends during high, all my high school years. And then my brother was a, also was a reporter for the Newark News after he finished school. And so I think it was in my bones. <laughs> when I came down here, I didn't drive. Um, and my husband was a railroad engineer, so he was working all kinds of hours, days and night. And so I started a hospital auxiliary for Riverview Hospital where we wrapped bandages. But all the women in the auxiliary came to my house because I had two children and um, couldn't drive, couldn't go out any place. So I had them come to my house. And um, I used to send a report of all of our meetings to the, Atlantic, to the uh, Long Branch Daily Record. And Dottie Grosser was the editor of the record at the time. And she called me up and she said, hey, you write pretty well, how about coming and writing for us? I said, gee, never even thought of that. So I said, sure, I'll be happy to. And my husband was very, very old fashioned <laughs> and did not believe that his wife should work at all. So he refused to allow me to make any money. And I had to beg him, we compromised. And I said, you know, I really want to write. I really like to write. I'll do it for nothing. And he said, okay, if you want to do it, by all means do it, but you're not going to get any money for it. And so when I first started writing for the Long Branch Daily Record, I did not get paid because I couldn't accept money because my husband wouldn't let me. Okay. So you were willing to pay. <laughs> I came down here to Highlands. Jimmy, my husband, um, made it very clear that Highlands was full, full, full of history. He had gone to Leonardo High. He was very proud of the fact that he had been in Leonardo High. He never graduated from there, but he was proud that he had gone there.
knew all the history of Middletown, knew all the history of the Bay Shore, and wanted to make sure that I knew it as well. So um, that's where I got my love for local history. I had I worked for the Long Branch Record and for Dottie Grosser for I, I really don't know how many years, but um, in 1966, uh, my youngest daughter was born. The, the youngest of our four children, Tracy, was born. And 1967, the Highland Star was was pretty active, and it was a local week, weekly newspaper for Highlands. And Marge Black was the editor of that. And she called me up and said, hey, you're writing for the record. Why don't you write for your hometown paper? And I said, sure. So I was writing for the Highland Star and the Daily Record. And then in 1967, uh, Matt Gill bought the uh, Courier from Otto Barth from uh, Bayshore Publishing. And he wanted to expand the newspaper to cover more than Middletown. So he called me up and he said, uh, would you come write for the Courier? I said, sure, I'll write for anybody. So, and at that time I could get paid for writing too. <laughs> so um, that's how I started writing for The Courier. And the, my primary reason for writing for The Courier was to help him expand the coverage area to Highlands and Atlantic Highlands. Tiki Smith was the editor, Lucille P. Smith. Uh, we were not related, we just were very fortunate to marry two good men named Smith. <laughs> I never knew Matt Gill before. Nope, I didn't even know anything about him, to tell you the truth. I suppose I did know that he owned a travel agency in Middletown, um, but I really did, that's about all that I knew about Matt Gill. And I knew he was a real estate man. Um, once I met him, then I certainly learned a lot about him because there's another man who was so, so proud of Middletown, so proud of where he lived, so proud of, um, how he helped develop Middletown from the farmland that he knew and loved and that his father, Mr. Gill, he had great respect for his father, Tom Gill. And um, uh, he wanted to do everything that his dad wanted him to do. So I always had great respect for Matt for his love for both of his parents. Matt Mackerel was a terrific businessman. He was a realtor, he was a travel agent, and he bought the newspaper without any knowledge of journalism, any knowledge of newspapers. He just thought it was the right thing to do. Tiki Smith had already been the editor. She had been working for someone else and for the owner prior to him. And so um, he trusted her, and um, Billy Eastman was working for us too at the time and he was the photographer and he also covered news stories, covered a lot of sports and Matt put his trust in him. Um, we started out the Courier in the Gill House which was a big brown house on Route 35 next to where the Gill Travel Agency was and our offices were in the living room and the dining room of the house. Tiki and I were in the dining room, Bill Eastman was in the front room. He did the, his dark room work in the kitchen, and um, the, you came up the steps in the front to, to you know, get your subscriptions or buy your paper or whatever you wanted to do. And then um, when he uh, built the travel agency, um, we moved into the basement of the travel agency. So the real estate office and travel agency were on the first floor, and we were in the basement downstairs across from where Howard Johnson's is on the quarter of Route 35 there. 714 Highway 35, really? Middletown, New Jersey. <laughs> 07748, some things you never forget. <laughs> it was Gilville right behind us is where there was a great, um, a great neighborhood of black folks lived in there, wonderful people. Um, Jimmy Jones was one of them. Jimmy Jones was in our office all the time and I could talk forever about Jimmy Jones. He was an elderly black man that Matt Gill respected so much because he knew so much about Middletown and he did a lot of work around the building for Matt. Uh, he did a lot of, he emptied out our garbage and things like that, but you could always learn from Jimmy Jones. Um, loved pineapple wine. Yeah. <laughs> did have some sometime. It wasn't my favorite, but I could certainly drink it. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the name. Duffy Fisher. 
Duffy Fisher was another fine gentleman that lived at Guildville. Had four, six children. I, all I remember is that I was so impressed by Duffy Fisher, not only because he used Fels Nat the soap to move everything to, down the river. He, he moved things on barges down the river, and he always used Fels Nat the soap to do it. He had either four or six children, and every one of his children went to college, and every one of his children was um, well accomplished and very successful later on in life. A tough thing for any family during the 60s and 70s and 80s, but for a black family to have all those accomplishments in this area was really very extraordinary. Wonderful, wonderful people, and we all learned so much from them. They were just great people. No, I think Mr. Gill owned a lot of property there, and uh, he had a lot of little places on his property, and people just came to live there. And so um, they just called that one section where all people lived that all knew Mr. Gill. I mean, we always called him Mr. Gill, and Matt always called him Father, um, or, or where Matt lived. And they just simply called that whole area Gillville, and that's all I know about it. It was, you knew it was Gillmill, that's all. <laughs> It was a section of Middletown. Probably in the 70s. I think probably the last time you ever heard of it was in the 70s. And then Matt lived in the house um, further back in Gilville at the very end. Uh, now I forget the name of that road. <laughs> um, but his house was the one that part of um, the Miracle Worker was, was filmed at. And his house was also, well, it was the barn that was that was used in the filming of The Miracle Worker. But Matt lived in the house, and the house was built from the same plans that the Shadowbrook and uh, Shrewsbury were built. The, it, the readership was predominantly in Middletown there. Uh, Tiki had started covering Hazlitt, because Matt, Matt wanted to expand to the whole Bayshore. Uh, Matt loved the whole Bayshore, he loved his Middletown, but loved the water too. He loved all parts of uh, the Bay Shore here. And um, he wanted to expand to have the courier cover the whole Bay Shore from Keyport to Highlands. And he was successful in doing that. Um, uh, he, he, I guess Highlands, Tiki had already started uh, covering Hazlitt and covering all the meetings in Hazlitt. And then he was expanding to Keyport. But before he did that, he, he had me come on and so we expanded into Highlands and Atlantic Highlands. And I covered both of those towns. And Tiki covered Middletown and Hazlitt. And then Walt Garner and Bill Eastman, even though they had other jobs with the paper and weren't necessarily the reporters with the paper, covered uh, Keyport and uh, Keyport. And we went into Ma uh, Matawan a little bit, not too great into Matawan. And Joan Turner, of course, covered Keensburg. And, um, we all took turns with Union Beach. We all kind of, uh, Tiki more than anybody else covered Union Beach, but we all went up and covered Union Beach too. Another great town, Carmen Stapiello was the mayor there before he was a county freeholder. Great people and we always liked Keyport as well, uh, Union Beach. John Merla was the mayor of Keyport and um, we got along great with him up there too. When we talk about covering a town, we, we mean that we went to uh, all the council meetings and dear God, there were lots of council meetings and, and we went to the council meetings and we also usually covered the planning board meetings and the zoning board meetings, always covered them if there was something big coming up. And in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of de de construction going on here, a lot of development going on here. And so we covered we went to all of those meetings, we came back, we wrote the stories. Uh, at the time, um, the reporters sat at a table at the council and planning board meetings. You sat at the table right in front of the mayor and council, so you were sure to hear every word. And then afterwards, you had the opportunity to ask them all questions, and then you could cover, you know, follow up on the stories that they didn't cover completely during the meeting. And all of us reporters tried to scoop the other reporters. At that time, we phoned in our stories at night. So I had to go home, write the story, and then I got on the phone and dictated my story to, the, to somebody at the office who would then be typing it as I was dictating it. 
Well, the daily papers, you know, produce this, 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 the um, stories that next day. Um, meetings are over usually between 10 and 11 o'clock at night. And then we had to go home and write the story and then call it in. And, um, uh, and it was in the press the next day. The press and the register, when the register was a daily newspaper, um, uh, usually printed 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And the papers came out you know, later on in the morning, seven or eight o'clock in the morning, the papers were out on the street. Um, the courier, our, our deadline was a Wednesday at noontime. So Tuesday night meetings, I didn't have to write for the courier until Wednesday morning, but I had to have them done. And I was in the office then, so I had them done Wednesday mornings. Um, but Wednesday night meetings didn't get in the courier until the following week. But then we put a new angle on it. You know, we would put something else that happened after the meeting or something that happened at the meeting. And the, as a result, other things happened. So we could uh, update the story for the following week's paper, basically. Journalism is so different today from what it was in the Matt Gill days, in the days of the weekly newspapers, in the days when we had real journalism when you really did ask both sides of the question, where you really did write stories. Sure, did we write partial story, impartial stories? We wrote impartial stories when we wrote our news stories. In The Courier, we had the Around the Halls column, which was our, our salvation for writing all of our straight news stories. I do think we were always fair, and I always felt that we were fair, because I remember writing lots of stories where I didn't like the story that I was writing, but it was news and I had to write it. And so um, I do think that we did a good job then. The impact of the Courier on Middletown, I think was highly significant because it was the weekly newspaper that, yeah, could be controversial, could, be, uh, could search out stories that other papers were afraid to talk about. Uh, Matt, as the publisher, gave Tiki and I leeway. Tiki was the editor, I was the associate editor. And Tiki and I could sit there and say, ah, okay, what are we going to talk about this week? And um, when Matt came down at lunchtime, because he always bought the entire staff lunch, we couldn't go out of the office on a Wednesday. He brought in cold cuts and everything, and we had our lunch there. Uh, and Matt always came down and sat with us and asked what our stories were. Never criticized our stories. Never, he just let Tiki and I have our way. The funny thing about that, though, was, um, he did like to write his own editorials. And when I say he liked to write his own editorials, the writers wrote his editorials, but they were all his ideas. And Thursday afternoons, Matt used to go to bars, restaurant in Highlands all the time. Uh, he would sit at the bar and just be talking to people because he wanted to hear what stories they liked in the Courier, what they were criticizing about the Courier, how they felt about the stories in the Courier. And when, and many times I was sitting down there with him, he'd invite me to come down just to hear the comments from people. And when somebody would come up and compliment him on an editorial, now I know I wrote that editorial, but I wrote it to, you know, the way he wanted it written. I, I wrote his opinions in it. But when people would come and compliment the editorial, Matt would say, thank you very much. That's exactly what I said. That's exactly what I said. And it was just kind of a fun thing because we knew, of course, he was a publisher. They were his opinions. And how it was worded was immaterial. It was his opinion, and that's the way it should be. Great memories at that time. It was wonderful. Um, because he was controversial, because he had so many opinions and was not afraid to express his opinions, I think he gave power to people. I think he changed elections. I think he um, made people aware of stories about people that they might never have known if the courier didn't exist. Mm -hmm. It was a good paper. <laughs> he didn't devote any time to it as far as doing any writing. We did the writing. <laughs> um, his interest was always there. He would come downstairs and, and say, hey, I just heard this on the street, tell me about this. And then we would have to go out and find out more about the story that he had heard about. Um, he was very protective of his police department. He loved, his, he loved Joe McCarthy, but wasn't 
afraid to um, criticize Joe McCarthy. And the two of them would be down there in the office. Tiki and I would be trying to write our stories and they'd be standing there battling back and forth with each other, good naturedly, but both expressing their opinions. It was two Irishmen that had strong opinions and knew that they weren't going to convince the other Irishmen, but they wanted to express how they felt. It was, it was wonderful. It was just great times. <laughs>
and I did have two or three children at the three kids I had at the time, and they were very protective of me. So they um, uh, they went into the house first, and then they came back out. One of them came back out and said, "Okay, you can come in. We've contained the dogs, but we want you to know it's not going to be pleasant for you in here. And are you ready for all of this?" And I said, "I can take whatever you guys can take." And they said, okay. So when we went in the house, they brought me into the one room first where there was um, all the painting on the floor, um, all witch signs and, and spiritual signs on the floor in the closet. Uh, they had opened the closet and there was sliding doors there and there were a bunch of white robes and white hoods and a bunch of white clothing in, the, in there. And then they brought me into the living room and they said, um, we don't want you to see the, the animals. And I said, oh no, you brought me here, I gotta see the whole thing. And unfortunately, yeah, they did show me, I'm sure they didn't show me all the animals, but uh, there were 20, 27, now I can't remember the number, but there were a lot of animals in the house, mostly small dogs, most of them abused, most of them beaten up. The one I remember particularly was blinded. Uh, a little Pomeranian type dog, just blinded and it was horrible, just terrible to see. But um, then I went inside and I was sitting on the couch, which with the woman who they were arresting. She had no shoes on. She, they arrested her at night, so she was ready for bed. And she was sitting on the couch and she was quivering and she was shaking. And I sat down next to her and she said, I know I'm in trouble. And I said, that's okay, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to the police headquarters too. I'm, I'm a reporter, I'm not a newspaper, I'm not a police officer, but I can be here with you. And um, she was very pleasant, very soft-spoken, and she was quivering and she was kind of afraid. She was never charged as a witch. Um, she was charged for abuse of animals, as well she should be. And I don't know whether she served time or whether she was just heavily fined, but there was an awful, awful lot of abuse of animals. The stories were, and I don't know if any of them are true, but the stories were that she used these dogs. She and a couple of men were involved as well. Um, the men were not charged as she was. Um, but uh, the story always was that they used these animals in sacrifices to the gods and to uh, whoever they were believing in at the time. Um, the animals were taken to the SPCA, and I know some of them had to be put down, and some of them did recover, um, and were, were, you know, adopted out by families. Wow. She's in her 90s today, sharp as a tack, sharp as Marion ever was. <laughs> Marion was married to um, a man named Palandrano, and uh, he was very friendly with the police. And Marion, another Irish woman with a uh, quite outspoken and quite definitive in, in her beliefs. And um, her husband was an Italian, also quite definitive and quite outspoken in his beliefs. And he was, um, he got sick and tired of Marion <laughs> yelling at him and telling him everything that she thought. And he was talking to some of his police friends and he said, you know, She's really a pain in the neck. She's really terrible. You got to do something about her. The neighbors are all complaining about her. One of the police officers was a neighbor. And so the police looked up. I love my police department in Middletown, but indeed, in order to satisfy their friend, um, they did find an old law on the books in Middletown that said a uh, common scold uh, was any woman who was a nuisance or was uh, 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 controversial in her neighborhood or spoke too much and the the idea was it was the law from the 1700s still in effect in Middletown because it had never been you know put down uh, was only directed towards women and so Marion being the Irish woman that she was said you're charging me with being a common scold I'll do some research as well so she researched and she found out that the penalty for being a common skull was to be on the, um, in socks on the front lawn of the public building in town or in the, the courtyard in town. So Marion said, you find me guilty, that's exactly the penalty that I want. <laughs>
Matt Gill loved the story. Matt Gill absolutely loved the story. He said, Muriel, you got to make sure you cover this. You got to make sure you cover it to the end because this is really a great story. So Marion used to come in the office fairly frequently and we did several stories on her. That was probably the first story I ever won uh, an award on, a state award on, was my story on the common scold. By the way, what happened uh, was Judge Patrick McGann heard the story. Um, the trial went on for quite a while. Uh, in the meantime, he was promoted to superior court judge, but he still had to lay down his opinion on this. And he found Marion not guilty because, of course, the law was not right because it was only directed at women. And this was in the 70s. And um, that's why there's no such thing as a common scold in, in the United States, I guess, but certainly in New Jersey. Um, Marion was friendly with um, Alice Maxwell. And Alice Maxwell was an editor of The Advisor, which was a weekly we called them throwaway newspapers because you had to buy the courier, but the cur the uh, uh, the um, other paper was thrown on your steps. Um, and Alice was at that paper. She and Marion were also great friends, and she then wrote an entire book on the common scold and talked about the common scold of the 1700s that the law was named for and that the law was designed because of. <laughs> Just last year, or the year before yet last, a sculptor uh, came to Marion Dunleavy um, and asked if she could sculpt her. And Marion said, sure, because Marion loves publicity as much as every woman does, every Irish woman. And she um, asked if she could sculpt her. As it turned out, all she wanted to sculpt was her jaw, her mouth, and her lips. Uh, and that sculpture is now down in one of the art museums on the uh, mall, on the, uh, the mall in Washington, D.C. Marion's gone down to see it. I haven't gone down to see it, but I know that it's there. I've seen it on, um, online. I've seen it that it's there. <laughs>
All of the neighbors in the area had complained a lot about all of the noise from the June concert, and so they didn't want another concert there. Dick wanted to have the concert in September, and so he uh, talked to Joe McCarthy, and he said he'd like to have the concert, and Dick Cleva and Joe McCarthy both agreed that yes, they could have the concert, but the concert would be over at, at 10 o'clock at night, and that would end it. So the September concert, there were maybe 3,000 to 5,000 people there. There was never any count on it. There were at least a dozen Middletown police officers there, and Joe McCarthy had also called in state police. So I know that there were some state police from Keyport that were also there. Um, the music was magnificent. The kids were, they loved it. If you know Clearwater Pool, which is now um, um, an apartment de development, the trees behind it, the woods behind it are all still there, and they all go over towards Atlantic Islands, towards Ocean Boulevard. Um, great big wooded area. It's Hartshorn Woods, part of Hartshorn Woods. And um, they, um, uh, yes, there were a lot of kids going in the woods. Were they smoking? Sure, they were smoking pot. Were they drinking? Sure, they were drinking. There were a lot of underage people there. So when 10 o'clock came and the band was still going strong, uh, Dick Cleaver tried to cut, uh, to shut off the band because he wanted to adhere to what he had agreed to with Joe McCarthy. And of course, with thousands of people there having a great time, they didn't want it shut off. And so they plugged the, uh, every time Dick went to unplug the speakers, people in the crowd or people in the band would, would um, plug it in again. Um, there was a point there that allegedly it was Danny Federici, who uh, was in the band, who um, knocked over the uh, one of the loudspeakers, one of the boxes, and it hit Joe McCarthy. And um, Danny, being no dope, <laughs> ran off. Presumably he took to the woods. The story is, and I don't know whether it's true, but the story always is, that somebody picked him up in a car, put him under a blanket in the back seat of the car, and that's how he got out of there. And that's how Danny Frederici always had the name The Phantom up until he died. He was always referred to as The Phantom because he was never arrested. And Joe McCarthy always wanted to arrest him. And there were others that were arrested at night. I think there were about a dozen people that were arrested. Uh, and, and might there have been some brutality? Depends on how you describe brutality. Do I think kids uh, do I think the police grabbed kids and said, hey, come on, you got to get home? Do I think some of these police knew the kids, didn't want to arrest them because they knew their families? Because so many of the police were also from the Bayshore. Um, I do think there was a lot of that. Do I think um, some kids did get nasty because they were high on pot, because they were drinking, because they weren't capable of al handling alcohol? There was probably a lot of that. I think there were probably problems on both sides. Um, I, I don't know. It was the beginning of an era. It was the beginning of a time. They were all hippies. Uh, you know, the older people, the Joe McCarthy's. Um, even my age, we didn't like the long hair. We didn't like the bralettes. We didn't like the sloppy dress. Um, so I think that there was a kind of an animosity between the two because of it. Um, I think they all tried to work out. A, a lot of it, I think, was misunderstanding. And I think we all learned a lot from it. They, they were probably the biggest ones. Um, when Roselli Stavola was the only garbage collector for Ola Middleton and was going in for his contract again, Matt was against that, so Matt wanted us. We had done this whole series of stories that uh, our story said that the bidding wasn't done properly, the bidding doesn't want, wasn't done right. And uh, so we had done a bunch of stories. And then we had written an editorial, uh, and I wrote the editorial, but Tiki put on the headline, and the headline was Kick Out the Syndicate. So the Roselli Stavola family sued the courier and Matt Gill for referencing a syndicate, and they said that it aligned them with the mafia. And um, so that went to court. Um, I remember it cost Matt $10,000 to have it go to court, because uh, he had to have attorneys represent him. Nothing ever came of it. Um, 
we never got anything except an awful, awful lot of good publicity. Um, a lot of people bought the, peri the paper just to read the story about the syndicate. Um, but that was kind of interesting at the time because um, uh, it was just the one word that people found very offensive. They, they aligned syndicate with the mafia. I remember when I had to go to testify in that case, um, one of the questions they asked me was, what was the last book you read? Because the Godfather had come out and they wanted to align me with the Godfather and that's why we use the word syndicate. And I was embarrassed because the last book I had read at that point was Joe Namath's book, I Can't Wait Until Tomorrow Because I Get Better Looking Every Day. And I was afraid, I was ashamed to admit that I had read a book about Joe Namath. <laughs> that was a fun one. Uh, many times my life was threatened. Many times my life was threatened. If we wrote anything about the police that was uh, people thought was untrue, um, I would get strange phone calls from people saying, um, uh, you know, you, you, you got to be careful. You better watch out. Your car is going to be bombed. Uh, uh, watch out. Check your tires before you go anyplace because they're all going to be slashed. Uh, don't go home at night alone. Uh, there were a lot of calls like that. but. Um, when people make threats like that, it's because they're, I don't know, weak, because they're afraid. I, I don't ever believe they mean to carry any of that stuff out, so I don't ever take threats seriously. Politics then was so different from what it is now, because yes, the Republicans and the Democrats fought with each other. They fought with each other all the time at the table. They both wanted to put their own opinions out there. But at the end, they all went to, to Bucky Smith's for a drink together, and they all sat down and they talked together. Um, I particularly remember Buddy Folks, who was the mayor of Middletown, was on council for about 10 years, mostly in the 60s and then in the early 70s. A great, great mayor, a great man. Um, don't think he was born in Middletown, but he went to Leonardo High School. Uh, he was an Eagle Scout, which always impressed me. When he was a Boy Scout, he was an Eagle Scout. He was one of the founders of Little League in Middletown, and you can always respect a guy like that. Wonderful guy. He was a mayor, head of the Republican Party. Matt was a staunch Democrat, an Irish Catholic. He had to be a Democrat. And they were great friends. Uh, buddy folks would come in the office during the years that Matt had the courier and he was the mayor or on the township committee. They would discuss a lot of stuff. They would be fighting there in front of us. And then they'd both end up shaking hands and laughing, and that was the end of it. Things are different today, but at that time, politics was, um, let's get things done. I want it done my way, but let's get things done, and then don't let it disturb our friendships. I don't think it's that way so much anymore. Uh, well, I remember meeting an awful lot of people because one of the things, one of the fun things I did was the Garden State Art Center opened during that time. And at that time, the, all of the um, entertainers were there for a week at a time. And the first day they came, they um, uh, always had lunch with all of the reporters. And at that time, there were a lot of different newspapers around here, maybe 10 or 12 of us. Um, and we would all go for lunch. Um, mostly in Keyport, I think it was, uh, at a diner or at a restaurant that the Arts Center treated us all to, and we would meet the, um, the stars, the entertainers that were there then. So I met lots of them at that time. Uh, one of my favorite memories is Johnny Cash. I love Johnny Cash to begin with. But Johnny Cash was there, and we were all sitting at the table. My brother was down from the Newark News. He was interviewing from the Newark News. Having Johnny Cash in New Jersey and having him in Monmouth County was a big deal. And um, the Newark News was covering it. And we were all asking the very nice questions because we were all so impressed by an, an actor, a, a, an entertainer, and everything like that. I was sitting next to my brother, and I was asking questions about uh, June Carter and things about his family life and stuff. And then my brother says, so, John, why don't you tell us about the time you were in prison? And I was horrified. I thought it was a terrible question. I later learned, of course, my brother was right. I mean, he was asking the questions that no other reporter was going to ask. And Johnny Cash responded to him. Liberace is another one that I remembered all the time. Um, he always had another star with him, and we always received the, 
new recording of the a star that he was uh, an up and coming person that he was promoting. Um, we always got his, uh, we got recipe books from him. He, uh, he used to give us recipe books and his life story. And we have pictures of him with his candelabra and things like that. Uh, they were all very nice and they were very gracious. We were very impressed because we were small town newspaper reporters and to be meeting the stars was really kind of impressive. Um, that's how I also got to meet President Jimmy Carter um, because uh, Jody Powell was his PR guy, was Jimmy Carter's PR guy. And his idea was to have small town weekly newspapers get to know Jimmy Carter a little better. So Matt called me up one day and he said, would you like to go to Washington and meet Jimmy Carter? Sure, I'd like to go to Washington and meet Jimmy Carter. So he said, okay. And uh, so Matt arranged me for me to stay at the Washington Hotel in Washington, elegant, uh, right near the White House. And um, uh, there were 26 of us reporters that were there with, um, with Jimmy Carter. And he came in and sat down at the table in, uh, in the Oval Office with us and we could all ask him any questions we want. Again, we were so impressed by being small town newspapers reporters and being with the President of the United States. He was very, very gracious. Yep, I, uh, Joe Azalina and I were friends, enemies, friends. Uh, always had respect for him, even when he fired me. <laughs> uh, Matt Gill died in 1982, and when Matt died, Joe Azalina being the historian and the proud person that he was, wanted to make sure that Middletown still had a hometown newspaper. I will always respect him for that. And so Matt, uh, Joe Azalina bought the newspaper and Joe um, kept Tiki and I on, of course, as the editor and, and the uh, associate editor. Um, Joe was from Highlands. Joe's father had a, a, a grocery store on Miller Street in Highlands and they started the food basket, which was the forerunner of the food town, which was the beginning of the whole food town chain. So Joe always had an affinity for me because I lived in Highlands, because I loved the fact that he was from Highlands. The fact that Joe was Navy, I also always loved. He loved it because my son was a Marine. Uh, my daughter was a Marine. Uh, when my second daughter went into uh, University of South Carolina and she ended up, uh, she was ROTC and she was a naval, naval officer. We always had a Navy connection among, between us and always respected each other for all of that. Joe was wonderful as the publisher of the paper. He just let Tiki and I do everything we wanted. Except in 1988, <laughs> 1988, my hus I was a Democrat and my husband was running for council in Highlands and uh, Frank Pallone was running for his first term as a congressman, uh, succeeding Jim Howard, who I loved as a congressman of my district, um, third congressional district. Um, and Frank had worked for Jim. When Jim died, uh, Frank was running for his seat. So he was running for Congress the same year my husband was running for uh, borough council in Highlands. Joe Azalina was running as a Republican in competition to Frank Pallone. So Joe came in the office one day and said, uh, you can't write anything about Frank Pallone. I said, what do you mean I can't write about Frank Pallone? You're a newspaper. He said, nope, you can't write anything about Frank Pallone. And I said, well, I'm telling you, I'm gonna write about Frank Pallone. I said, what I w can do is always give you a right-hand page. The odd number pages are always the first read in the newspaper, in a tabloid. I said, I'll give you always the right-hand page and I'll put him on a left-hand page I will always, if I have a picture of him, I will always have a picture of you, and his stories won't be any longer than yours. And he said, doesn't make any difference, you can't have him in there. And I said, I gotta have him in there, and if, you're, if you wanna be a newspaper, you gotta have him in there. And um, Joe, Joe Carillas, another dynamite guy, another very high class, very professional person. Didn't deserve the word politician, he was just a class act. Uh, Joe came to me one day, Joe Carillas came to me one day and said, Hey, Muriel, I just want you to know that um, if, if Joe Azalina wins the election, you're okay. You're, you're going to be able to keep your job. But if Frank wins the election, 
I think Joe's going to fire you. And like I said, I was a de Democrat at the time. And I said, then I can't lose. I said, either my guy gets in or I have a job. Well, I, I'm not going to lose either way. And I wrote my stories exactly as I said I would. Joe always had a right-hand page. He always had a picture, if Frank had a picture. And I measured, I actually measured the inches to make sure that I didn't give Frank any more inches than I gave Joe. Frank won the election. My husband won the election. Joe lost the election. And um, Joe came in the office the day after the election. And I learned new swear words that day because Joe was absolutely livid, absolutely livid. And um, he left the office and Buddy Allen worked for Joe at the time. He was a Republican. He was a freeholder at the time. And he came in the next day around um, three o'clock in the afternoon. And he came in the office and brought me into the back room. And our office was in the post office building at the time. And he said, um, well, you, you can resign. And I said, why am I going to resign? He said, well, I'm going to let you resign from the courier. And I said, why would I resign from the courier? And he said, well, because um, Joe, you know, you weren't fair to Joe. And I said, I was very fair to Joe. I, I, he's a newspaper. I gave him equal space. I did put him, I did favor him a little bit, but no, maybe people would notice that. And he said, well, if you're not going to resign, then um, we're going to have to let you go. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And I said, because I was a journalist, you're going to let me go? And he said, yes. So he called Joe on the phone. And I got up to leave. And I heard him saying to Joe on the phone, the bitch won't resign. <laughs> and uh, so then Joe called me on the phone. And he said, Muriel, Muriel, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. And I said, OK. And he said, um, you know, I could have won that election, but he said, you ruined me. You absolutely ruined me. You destroyed me. And I said, how did I destroy you? He said, because you, you just destroyed me. And he said, uh, you had all those other stories in. And so I didn't have a chance. And I said, is the courier that well read? And he said, yes, it is. And I said, the courier has that much influence? And he said, yes, it does. And I said, so is now the time to ask you for a raise? And he swore at me again. <laughs> And he said, that's the end of the story. And so um, that ended it. I was fired from the courier. This is 1988. Before I got home, before I left the office, the uh, Malcolm Forbes office up in uh, Messenger Gazette called me up, said, I hear you lost your job. I said, holy cow, I haven't even told my husband yet. And they said, doesn't make any difference. Come up here with us. We want you. Steve Forbes bought the paper and did away with all of the editors. They, Malcolm had owned 12 newspapers only because his father owned newspapers. They were not money makers for him, for sure. Um, and so Steve was doing away with that. And we, um, so I lost my job there. And then I was down here. Matt, uh, Joe had hired four or five different people who worked at the Courier as editors, took my place. Tiki had died prior to this. And I was the editor. Um, Matt had, Joe had hired four or five different guys who stayed briefly and then left because they didn't like the job or didn't get along or I don't know what it was. So I applied for the job again. And I went to Joe and I said, hey, you know, I'd like to work for the carrier again. And he said, do you think you can do it? And I said, yes. And he said, do you think you can do what I say? And I said, only if it agrees with what I want to do. And he said, well, we'll try you out. We'll see how you do. And I said, I can promise you I'll always write good stories about Highlands and I'll always write good stories about the Navy. And he said, okay, well, let's find out. Let's try it. And so I went to back to work for Joe Asselina. And he was wonderful as a publisher. Never bothered me about any story after that. Never questioned any story I wrote. And we, I had always had respect for Joe and I had even more respect for him after that. Great guy, great guy. I must have left the Courier in 1995 or 96 because my husband in 1995 had had um, a series of heart attacks all within 60 hours and had quintuple bypass. And we realized that God was giving us a message to 
do, change our lives. So I was working at the Bayshore Development Office at that time for the state of New Jersey, and he was an engineer on the railroad. So he retired from the railroad. I just left my job at the Bayshore Development Office, and for our 40th wedding anniversary, we bought us an RV, and we took off in an RV, and we lived in an RV and traveled around the United States for the next 10 years. I keep writing because it's in my blood. I can't not write. Uh, uh, it's not a job. Journalism was never a job for me. Journalism was nothing I ever had to do. Journalism was, was always something that I just wanted to do. I just love to write. Um, I, I, I think because I love to write so much, um, one of the things I'm proudest of is that each of my four children has always said that she or he never had a job they didn't love, he didn't love. And um, I take credit for that because I never had a job I didn't love. And I, my kids reflected that at home. They knew I was happy doing everything I did. Sure, they got away with some stuff sometimes because I was in a good mood because I was, something good was happening with the newspaper. But um, I think it made them always choose jobs that they themselves love too. And I think that's a great accomplishment. I don't think you should ever work a job for money. I don't think you should work a job for anything other than that you're helping someone else and you're making yourself happy.